Welcome to EPG Patshala. We are looking at the paper on English literature from 1590 to 1798 and today we will be looking at the sonnet in England as it was practiced by Edmund Spencer and Philip Sidney. I am Anna Kurian and I teach in the Department of English at the University of Hyderabad. This unit will cover a basic introduction to 16th century English culture, paying particular attention to royal cultures and how they were instrumental in fostering literary activity during this period. We will also be looking at the sonnet sequence in English culture as well as European culture and how the sonnet first appears in England and later on how Sidney and Spencer, the two poets we are studying today, pay particular attention to their work and so on. We will be looking at the Petrarchan conventions as they apply to Sydney's text of Astrophil and Stella and we will be looking at topics and themes and basic ideas but in addition we will also be doing a reading of sonnet 4 and 10. Then we will progress to Spencer's Amoretti and there we will be looking at sonnet 7 and 20 where Spencer changes the Petrarchan conventions and instead marries them to Protestant ideologies in Elizabethan England. So let's begin then with looking at Tudor England and its culture and society. Now the court of course is central to any imagining that we might ever make of the literary culture of the period and during this period lot of the poets who were writing all of them wrote about or to the queen who was ruling. Now before the arrival of Queen Elizabeth on the English throne in 1558, there was King Henry VIII and later on his son and after that we have his daughter Bloody Mary and finally we come to Queen Elizabeth. Now Queen Elizabeth as she ruled in England for a very long time from 1558 through to 1603, she also cornered the market on attention from the poets and literary figures in the court. So court attention and royal attention is central to any, anything that we might have to do with the literary figures of the time, especially of course the poets. Also because all of them wrote in praise of her. The most obvious example is of course something like Spencer's Fairy Queen, which is supposed to glorify her and to exalt her. Now all the other poets as well usually talked about, if they were writing love poetry, they talked about this kind of elusive mistress who had great power, great beauty, everything about her was wonderful and good and she was far removed from the lover who could only then approximate to her by writing poetry about her but could never have direct access to her. And this is of course also relatable to the provincial romances of European literature which were popular earlier to this. Now, all these poets who wrote in praise of their loved lady and who's, where the loved lady was this exalted woman of high stature and who was inaccessible to the lover. Now this anguished lover poet is fashioned from a continental model which was already available during this period to them. And there was this clear voice of agony and personal lamentation. So all of them wept and mourned because there was this beautiful woman and they all talked about her beauty in some length. So all sonnet sequences as well as all love poetry give us a composite picture of the beauty of the loved one and the inaccessibility of the loved one. Then of course she is also a personification of all possible virtues. So she is good and she is virtuous and she embodies in herself all the perfection that can ever be desired from any woman. Now, having a woman like that and of course her position in society is also assured. So nobody is ever falling in love with lower class women. It's usually the queen or somebody who stands in for the queen or ladies of high class whom they then adopt as the figure of the beloved. And then you had the lover. The lover's figure was also shaped in very definite ways. He was somebody who was of the same class and yet was separated from the woman either because she did not return his love or because there were circumstances which were beyond their control which prevented them from achieving happiness in their love. So either she would be married to somebody else or she was forbidden because her parents had arranged a different marriage for her, whatever might be the reason. The inaccessibility of the beloved is something that is central to the idea of love poetry during this period. Then of course we have the migration of the Italian sonnet 
to the England in the time of Henry VIII. Now, this takes place primarily due to the efforts of Wyatt and Howard, Earl of Surrey, during the period of Henry VIII. And these two, Thomas Wyatt the senior and Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, they both wrote sonnet sequences and these were then published in what is today called Tottles Miscellany. Earlier it had a different title as well, Tottles Songs and Sonnets, but today it's usually called just Tottles Miscellany and they were published therein. Now Howard and Wyatt also were responsible for reshaping the sonnet from the Petrarchan model to what is called the English sonnet form. So where the Petrarchan model had the two had a quart, uh, had a octave and a sestet. The English sonneteers then transformed it into something which had three quatrains and which was followed up with a couplet. And they also gave it its very definite rhyme scheme, which more or less remains the same in the ages to come. Now, the general structure of the sonnet is seen being formed during Henry VIII's time, and it is later adopted by both uh, Sidney as well as Spencer and later on still you have several others as well who practice the sonnet form and chief among them is of course always William Shakespeare. But in addition to him there were poets such as Samuel Daniels who practiced the uh, sonnet form and of course John Milton later on. There was also John Donne who is supposed to have written both holy sonnets as well as love poetry and who in all of his verse, in all of his sonnet writing, then employs the sonnet form in its English version rather than its Petrarchan version. So we take the legacy of the sonnet right up till approximately the 18th century and actually the sonnet remains a form dear to English poets even today. Now very briefly let us consider the life and times of Philip Sidney and of course his work and later on we will move to a brief introduction regarding Edmund Spencer and his life and his work as well. Now Philip Sidney is usually known to students of literature as this perfect renaissance gentleman. The courtier, the soldier and the gentleman all rolled into one. He was also a poet but he was a poet by accident not because he wanted to be a poet. What he wanted to be was this foremost courtier who would then transform affairs of state and who would have major role to play in court activity. This unfortunately didn't work out. Now the mythology which has sprung up around Philip Sidney is one that gives him to us as this perfect gentleman who was gallant, who were chivalrous, who had of course great wit, great intellect but we gloss over faults of his which are now of course visible and which were things such as a very quick temper where he was hasty in promising death and damnation to anybody who crossed his path which is also not actually a chivalric way of behaving but instead he has been mythologized as somebody who was perfectly gallant even when he was lying close to death and he gave away his water canteen to somebody who deserved it more because he said your need is greater than mine. So Philip Sidney is then born in the 1550s and he dies pretty early so by 1590 he's dead and gone already and what we have of him is also the fact what we know of him is also the fact that he is descended from royalty closely connected to Elizabeth the first favorite courtiers and his father was governor in uh, Ireland he was also somebody who traveled widely on the continent of Europe was acquainted with many languages and is responsible for the first critical text in English on literature which was called the defense of poetry. Now Philip Sidney was also instrumental in writing what today we know as Arcadia. There are two versions of this, there's the old Arcadia and there's the new Arcadia. But Philip Sidney also wrote in addition to this a sonnet sequence which was called Astrophil and Stella and which we'll be examining a little while from now. Now Edmund Spencer was born in 1554 and interestingly enough he was born to a humble family in London. He was the son of a weaver and he went to school, a good school of the time and from there went on to university as well because of the generosity of a barrister. And that we should keep in mind because it's also one of those stories of upward mobility that we hear about in Elizabethan England. Now Edmund Spencer also because he made certain connections, he networked well shall we say during his time at university, was given a pos government position and he was sent as a secretary as a part of the government 
to the first colony of England, that is Ireland. And it is in Ireland that he spends 20 years of his life, eventually, of course, coming back to England only to die. He, of course, made various trips in between, but basically he spends his life working in Ireland. It is also that uh, true that Edmund Spencer, even though he observed Ireland, the first colony, with a close eye, he felt very bad for the extreme poverty, the kinds of distress that the people over there lived in. But he was also extremely certain that the only way to survive in Ireland, for the English to survive in Ireland, was to destroy all opposition and to keep the Irish in their place. So he advocated brutal treatment of the Irishman. If you think about Edmund Spencer's role in the colony of Ireland, and he has a text about it as well, what we see is that he juggles between two positions. Even when he feels sympathetic towards the Irish for the troubles that they have, he also believes that in the interests of the English, it is better to keep them in their place, to crack down on them brutally so that they will not attempt to revolt. Now, Edwin Spencer is known primarily to students of literature as writer of the Fairy Queen. And the Fairy Queen is an important text, especially because it's supposed to be the first English epic or it would have been if he had ever completed it. But it's also because it was written to glorify and he made it very clear that it was written to glorify Queen Elizabeth. Now, this aim of his also came true because not only did he write it, but after the first three books were published, he was able to go to England and take it himself and present it to the Queen. And the Queen was so pleased about it that she granted him a pension of 50 pounds a year as long as he lived. And this is actually something that she did for no other poet in England at that point in time. So then Spencer, we can see, has a particular importance in the history of English literature because of the Fairy Queen as well. Now, in addition to the Fairy Queen, he also wrote several other texts, and these include the Shepherd's Calendar and what we will be studying today, the Amoriti se selections from that. We will also be talking about the fact that of how the Amoriti came to be. Now, Amoriti means little loves, and he wrote it for whom he wrote it and why he wrote it also we shall be looking at shortly. Now, the sonnet sequence as it evolves in England had a constant tension between a Petrarchan and an anti-Petrarchan viewpoint. Now, the Petrarchan viewpoint was very simple, inaccessible love, a lover who was always pining and crying and so on and so forth for her. And in a sense, the whole sonnet sequence, if it was aiming for a Petrarchan style, showed us a lover then who was working towards exposing his feelings, his feelings of great love, intense despair, ardent longing, sadness because of the beloved's frigidity or because of the beloved's inaccessibility and so on and so forth. Now, what the English did with this is change it around to shape something else which was more important to them. So, in uh, Spencer's Amoriti, what we see is that he doesn't do this inaccessible loved one. Instead, he uses the sonnet sequence, turns it around and instead makes it about the love that he has for a woman and how that love eventually ends in marriage. So, in that sense, it's completely anti Petrarchan. William Shakespeare, of course, we know wrote a, s a set of 154 sonnets and his sonnets are even more interesting because he doesn't write them to a woman at all. He writes them instead. Most of them are written to a young man. So, the English poets did not then leave the sonnet as it was used on the continent of Europe. Instead, they changed it around, they indulged their anti Petrarchan sentiment and they made it into something completely new. But the Petrarchan dialectic between body and soul and love and reason continued to be there in the sense that the poems themselves focused upon ideas which were related to materiality, but also, of course, totally love that is so spiritual and such a higher emotion, but also the fight between reason and love, that love is an unreasonable emotion, is something that continues to be felt and seen in the sonnets of the time. Now, initially, we shall be looking at Astrophil and Stella, which is Sydney's uh, sonnet sequence published in 1591. Now, all of Sidney's poetry, because he was a nobleman, he did not get it published during his lifetime. All of it was published posthumously. During his lifetime, it was only circulated as a private document passing from hand to hand and not given publishing. Now, the 
fact that after his death it gets published is something that we ought to keep in mind also because the astrophil of the title astrophil and stella is supposed to have been philip sydney himself and the phil of astrophil is supposed to be related to the word philip and stella is of course the star the distant star for which he yearns but astrophil also means the lover of stars so the title itself gives us the woman as somebody who is like a star very far away and astrophil who is also of course philip who loves stars but cannot obviously reach them i mean no human being can and so therefore the text is already then set before us as a narrative which gives us the story of a star and the lover of the star now themes in astrophil and stella include several which are absolutely conventional and the same banal ones which were there seen in other sonnet sequences of the time he is of course astrophil in the sonnet sequence and if you wish to call him philip sydney that is also fine but actually astrophil is the speaker of the sonnets so he is the besotted lover but he is also the self critical poet who is concerned with how he will best then do justice to his muse and this is interesting because one of the earliest sonnets speaks about how he wants to write poetry and he keeps doing this whole imitative kind of thing and finally the muse hits him on his head and says if you want to write look into your own heart and write because that is the best poetry that you can write and that gives us that conflict which is part of the entire sonnet sequence as well that he wants to write like the great poets and sonneteers of earlier ages but because he must look into his own heart and write it has to be personal it has to be immediate it is his muse which has to be at the center so astrophil and stella is supposed to have been written by philip sydney for this woman called penelope deverox who was uh, initially supposed to have married him now the marriage didn't obviously happen and instead she marries somebody else so she becomes penelope deverox rich and after that is when Philip Sidney begins to write these sonnets to her. Interesting also because the very fact that she is married makes her inaccessible. So therefore there is this conflict between the true protestant gentleman courtier, the lover of religion who obviously can be only virtuous and who cannot do wicked things and there is the ardorous love of the renaissance poet and lover who for whom it does not matter that the beloved is married but who just loves her and so what the poem all sequence also shows is that we are introduced to several states one is of course the fact that usually the woman is absent the, the beloved is usually absent so the poet's grief at her absence then the poet's grief at the fact that she is so far away like a star the poet's annoyance anger despair because she is inaccessible to him unavailable to him his growing desire for her and this translates into both physical desire as well as emotional desire so his growing desire for her and then of course the all consuming despair that he feels because there is no chance that he is ever going to be able to attain her in fact astrophil and stella ends the final sonnets are all in this written in this mode of despair which is complete and total because by then there is also the recognition that he is never ever going to be able to attain this lady love now we will move on to a analysis a reading and an analysis of sonnet 10 of astrophil and stella now in this the poet the speaker speaks to reason he addresses reason if you notice he is not addressing and this is once again one of those conventions of petrarch which are being overturned over here instead of addressing the woman he is addressing reason and he says reason in faith thou art well well served that still would brabbling be with sense and love in me i rather wish thee climb the muses hill or reach the fruit of nature's choicest tree or seek heaven's discourse or heaven's insight to see why should thou toil our thorny soil to till leave sense and those which senses objects be deal thou with powers of thought leave love to will but thou wouldst needs fight both with love and sense with sword of wit giving wounds of disgrace till downright blows did foil thy cunning fence for soon as they struck thee with stella's rays reason thou kneelest and offer straight to prove by reason good good reason her to love so now if we look at this poem what we see is that 
like I said already, instead of addressing the woman, he addresses reason. And what he's saying to reason is, in a sense, is that instead of constantly squabbling with sense and love in the speaker, so reason basically is fighting with him, saying that he shouldn't love this woman, and he, why is it that he loves her, and so on and so forth. He says, instead of that, please go do other stuff, right? And then he goes through a set of reasonings and then eventually he comes to the main idea that if after all of this when reason is squabbling with sense and with love and with will, eventually he comes to the notion that all that it matters is that if reason catches sight of Stella, then reason itself will say, oh of course you should love Stella, there is no way that you can not love Stella. So even reason will bow before the beauty of Stella. Now. There is in this also, of course, the idea of the natural scale or the scalar nature or the great chain of being, an idea that was central to the Elizabethans. They believed that everything stood in an hierarchic order and this also applied to the human psyche which was divided into reason, will and appetite. Now, just like angels, humans and animals stand in a certain order. Similarly, reason, will and appetite also stand in a similar order. And over here, reason which is from the angels, will which is human and appetite which is from the animals. Will is overpowered because of appetite as well. But reason which belongs to the angels also will be overcome if Stella only appears. So what we have then is an acknowledgement of the great power of the beloved to conquer anybody, including reason, which is on the side of the angels. We move on now to the poem from Amoriti, which is Spencer's sonnet sequence. And we talk in some detail about the background to Amoriti as well before we examine his poem in detail. Now, Spencer's voice in Amoriti is really different from the voice of Sidney in his Astrophil and Stella. Now, Spencer wrote Amoriti as well as Epithalmion as a set which goes together and these were written on the occasion or soon after the occasion of his marriage to his second wife Elizabeth Boyle. Now Spencer who was son of a weaver as we already said and he took up government posts, worked in Ireland also then achieved social mobility because by working in Ireland he was given a castle for himself and he became gentry, he became fairly landed nobility and so he marries into the higher classes as well. So his second marriage to Elizabeth Boyle is one such example and it is the, the love he feels for Elizabeth Boyle which begins long before their marriage and eventually ends at the point when they get married. That is the story which is the background for Amoretti. It is one, if we co contrast it to Sydney's verse, Sydney of course is doing despair. He's doing unhappiness, he's doing the unattainability of his beloved. Over here, what we have is celebration. There is love, there is joy, and finally, of course, there is marital bliss. Now, all of the Petrarchan legacy is there in the poetry as well as in the language of the poetry. But instead of keeping it as being about a woman who is not directly linked to the poet but is a distant object of love, he instead relocates it and makes it all about Protestant Christianity and the wedding which is at the center of a Protestant Christian love tradition. He also does something else. The entire sequence of the Amoriti is supposed to be linked to the sequence of Lent itself and so we progress from a beginning which wherein there is uncertainty as to what exactly will happen to the final conclusion when there is great joy and that ends at a point when in the Christian calendar also there is great joy. So he connected Christianity in that sense with a Petrarchan kind of sonnet sequence and he melded the two together and gave it a new form completely. Now, Sydney's Astrophil, like we said, pursues a married woman, Penelope Devereux. But Spencer is in the pursuit of a woman who eventually he will woo and he will marry and they actually are fairly happy, of course, till he dies in 1599. Now, the title of the sequence, Amoretti, is Little Loves or Little Cupids. And this itself, even though it seems to give us a more pagan, shall we say, background, 
is built in built into that is the whole protestant model code model virtues which are essential to the idea of the marriage itself so we see once again that contrast between the petrarchan and the anti petrarchan that dialectic is in place in the works of spencer there is also something else that spencer keeps doing spencer even as he wrote a lot of literature and he is the first major figure in english literature who decided that he wanted to be the foremost poet of his time he but he wrote in a language that he thought was more poetic and it was actually archaic so he wrote in a spelling and a version that was seen as being more old fashioned and in fact lots of people laughed at him for the way that he wrote but he continued to preserve that style so if his spelling and his language are seen as more archaic his content is very timely very contemporary for him during the time that he lived it was perfectly fitting in into that time now he of course gives us a lot of the usual images the usual ideas that are circulating in all of the sonnet sequences of the time so you have ships in storms you have fair loves you have a lot of innocence and a lot of beauty and all of that all of them are seen as also being fairly hackneyed so in the amrity the one the poem that we are going to be looking at in some detail sonnet 20 we will see certain images which we would recognize because they are familiar to us from other sonnet sequences so you have lions and lionesses you have silly little lambs and you have of course the humble heart of the lover which is always being offered to the beloved now images and metaphors and conceits in the work of both sydney and spencer in their sonnet sequences are ones which are already in circulation so they are well known to all the readers everybody knows all of them but these two writers then gave it a certain freshness because of the ideas that they imbued it with now we will read sonnet 20 in vain i seek and so to her for grace and do mine humble heart before her poor the whiles her foot she in my neck doth place and tread my life down in the lowly floor and yet the lion that is lord of power and reigneth over every beast in field in his most pride disdaineth to devour the silly lamb that to his might doth yield but she more cruel and more savage wild than i the lion or the lioness shames not to be with guiltless blood defiled but taketh glory in her cruelness fairer than fairest let none ever say that you were blooded in a yielded prey now when we look at that poem it's actually a very banal sentiment that he is offering to us the sentiment gives us a lover who gives his heart to his beloved and the beloved tramples upon it she squelches it stamps it down upon the floor it is a sentiment that we see occurring over and over again in a lot of love poetry but also in other sequences drawn from popular culture where when the guy offers a heart the woman who is powerful at that point in time will immediately squelch it and there is nothing further happening he takes that banal sentiment and then he does something more with it what he does is even as in the first quatrain we are given this lover who yields himself to the beloved and the lady of course tramples him underfoot and subjugates him by placing her foot upon his neck he moves it in the next one instead of focusing upon the lady he takes us to the image of the lion now once again drawn from the natural history that was popular and which circulated in elizabeth in england natural history said that lions would not if a prey which they had caught yielded to them or pleaded for mercy then the lion would grant mercy to it now how we know this is of course uh, i mean it's rather open to constra- uh, understanding but if this was the belief he takes that belief and places it in the context of the poem and he says that like a lion grants mercy to a yielded prey so also should the lady then grant mercy to somebody like him who gives her his heart but he says the lady is actually far more cruel than any lion or lioness and she is willing to then kill something which has already yielded which is already pleading for mercy and it ends the final couplet ends with this plea from the lover that she should not defile herself in all her strength and in all her uh, cruelty by then killing something which is already a yielded prey what we see is 
an understanding of the poem which has been shaped in very traditional ways, canonical ways and yet it has also been reshaped into something which is fresh and something which is new. Now, Sidney and Spencer had a long effect, long lasting effect on the sonnet sequence as it developed in England. As we said further, uh, practitioners of the sonnet included of course the two major ones from the 16th and the 17th century are William Shakespeare and John Milton. Added to them we have others such as John Donne as well. Now, if all of these are placed in a kind of sequence, then Sidney and Spencer usually tend to get forgotten. This is because of two reasons. One is because Sidney and Spencer are also primarily remembered for their other contributions to English literature. So when you say Spencer, everybody says Fairy Queen. When you say Sidney, everybody says Defense of Poetry. And nobody remembers the fact that they had also to their credit these sonnet sequences. Later on, you have Shakespeare's efforts, Milton's efforts, and these took over the popularity and these were far more popular as sonnet sequences than Sidney's and Spencer's were. So given these two reasons, these two, Sidney and Spencer and their work kind of faded into the background. Samuel Johnson, one of the most influential early critics of English literature, he thought that the sonnet form itself was unthinkable, it was unsuitable and it was not really fit for English literature or English verse. But the sonnet then is rehabilitated in the 19th century by critics such as Leigh Hunt who reinstate sonneteers such as Spencer and create a genealogy of the English sonnet and give it to us. Later critics such as John Erskine also highlighted the importance of both Sidney and Spencer's sonnet sequence. The sonnet is important as a kind of memory figure for, of the Elizabethan era as well. It stands for a tradition and a literary form, but also for a history and a culture of the time. So today now we have looked at Sidney and Spencer and the sonnet form as it was practiced by the two of them. We have also covered some ground in examining the sonnet as it came to England as added, and as it developed therein. Thank you.